the lesson this morning on page 107. If you want to turn there in your books. In our class with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for all you do for us. We're thankful for this day that you've allowed us to come together and be able to open up your word, study from it, to be able to hear a message a little later on uh, brought that will enlighten us to what your will for us is and help us to to be motivated to, to do more, to uh, compare our lives with this, the Scripture teachings and determine where we need to make adjustments. We're thankful for your love for us. We're thankful that you were willing to give your son, that uh, he could be that sacrifice that would be able to take away the sins of the world. We're thankful for his love and his willingness to go to the cross for us and totally give himself up that we might be able to obtain salvation through his cleansing blood. We pray, Father, that as we live each day of our lives, we'll think of the sacrifice that's been made and, and what we need to do in our lives to sacrifice our own selves to be the servants that you want us to be. We pray, Father, that you'll bless us today in our study. Bless us as we worship. We pray, Father, we've come here for no other purpose but to praise and glorify thee and honor thee in your Son as we come together today. Help us to be mindful of his sacrifice. Help us to be mindful of heaven. Help us to be mindful of the forgiveness of sins, the cleansing power of the blood of Christ so many spiritual blessings that you've given to us every day on top of the material blessings that sustain us. We pray this morning, Father, a special way for those who are unable to be here due to the health issues. Uh, we pray, Father, that you'll bless them and give them strength and uh, renewed health that they might be able to be back with us. We pray, Father, for those who are indifferent to being here this morning. And we pray something would be said or done that would change their minds. We pray, Father, that the world would have open ears and hearts to the gospel. We pray that the gospel might have free course in this world. And we pray that there may be many who at least come to an understanding of the truth and be able to make a decision what they would choose to serve. We pray, Father, that you uh, be with us in the days ahead. Help us as we make our decisions and help us not lose sight of our goal of heaven. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. There are people today who teach the uh, idea of being predestined. Um, the idea that it doesn't matter what we do in life God has already decided who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. Um, it's hard to understand the concept or the, uh, the beginning point for that uh, religious belief, but it exists. There are people who believe that. It doesn't matter what we do. We want to look at some passages today and talk about that in, in quite a bit of detail. It is a disturbing viewpoint, um, and it has much difficulty, at least in my mind, uh, in, in how you deal with that. Because if we're predestined to be saved or not saved when we're born, how do we know that? How, how do we know when we're born? Um, 
there's just there's no ev- there's no evidence there's no proof of it uh, here's a child born into the family and and then later on maybe there's another child born into the family the first one was was destined to be saved but the second one wasn't <laughs> or perhaps God is predestinating people in terms of, from this religious viewpoint people in terms of maybe this whole family is going to be saved but this family's not how do you deal with that how do you understand that how do you come to an understanding of who is going to be saved and who's going to be lost because the doctrine that they teach is it doesn't matter what you do in your life you're already predestined when you're born and so I, I don't really know how to deal with that. First of all, like I said, how do you know who is predestined to be saved and who's predestined to be lost? How do you know that? And we're going to look at passages that just sort of open that up a little bit. Yeah. We're going to look at some passages that deal with that as we get started this morning. And and so I I thought about this and and how to um, try to take the doctrine of predestination and maybe weave it with Scripture to some degree to say, well, um, maybe there's... I mean, I I struggle with it. How do you, maybe there are people in the world, as we look at Scripture, and God encourages us to live a certain way, and then maybe if we make the decision somewhere in our life that we are going to live right, that was predestined, that we were going to do that. Well, it just doesn't make a lot of sense uh, of what we have to deal with. Um, and so that, there, there it is in Scripture. Well, you know, you, you can choose right from wrong. Well, that starts taking into account what we refer to in this lesson. And um, we've talked about it from time to time, free will. The, the freedom for you to make a decision. And, and the thing we're going to see in Scripture is, first of all, that God has made it clear in scripture that he wants all people to be saved uh say first timothy 2 3 and 4 there on the first page of your book this is good and acceptable in the sight of god our savior what is this is good who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth he desires all to be saved. It, it's not, if, if predestination was a doctrine that God had, or a, a teaching or whatever that God had put forth, then he would have said in, in, in some way to communicate with mankind, these people are going to be saved, or these people are intended to be saved. And so I want to push these people in a certain direction so that these people can be saved and that these people over here, that they were predestined not to be saved, so, you know, we're not going to really bother with them. That it, it, if that's the way, I mean, you look at it. How do you, how do you look at it? Um, If you look at it simply from the standpoint that predestination is a truthful religious belief that people have, then in the very basic bottom line, it doesn't matter what we do, you know? It doesn't matter what we do. We're either going to, we were predestined, we were predetermined to be saved or lost. And so, first of all, how has that been communicated to you? You're, you're born, you get to a certain age where you can start to think a little bit for yourself. Which category do you fit into? Were you predestined to be saved or to be lost? I don't know. I mean, how, how do you know? We're not born with some kind of a, a, a mark on us that gives a, an, a, 
immediate identity is, oh, that's one of those that's already predestined to be saved. And so, first of all, we just don't know that. How would you know that if, if you have that belief? Secondly, it doesn't matter what you do according to their doctrine. It doesn't matter if you live a life just full of sin. You're already determined to go one place or another, which defies all logic. Our God is a God of thinking. He's a God of plain um, laws and rules to live by. If, if you look at how he's laid them out, if you do this, then this is the way it's going to be. If you don't do this, this is the way it's going to be. Why do you even have those? There's no need for us to have any teaching whatsoever if we are predestined. We're not going to change what we were predestined to be, where we're going to go. It's, it's not anything we have control over. And so there's no need for us to do good or evil or whatever. We just do what we feel like doing. And it's going to turn out the way it turns out. Well, that's just not consistent with Scripture. Here we see that it's good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Acts 17 and verse 30, we've talked about that in the last lessons or so. Mars Hill, these people were worshiping everything that came along. Some new teaching came along. They say, hey, hey, this is, somebody's got something new here. Let's, let's set them down and hear what they've got to say. And Paul says, okay, I'm going to talk with you. And he says, I'm going to tell you who the, the true God is. And he begins to explain to him that he made the universe and all these things. And he says that the times of this ignorance, you just going around just finding something and trying to worship it, God winked at. But now commandeth, and we can't get any clearer with these words, all men everywhere to repent. Why would you have something like that if you're predestined? Why would Paul take the time to spend speaking the gospel, presenting the gospel? Why would anything in the world we do in terms of religion be of any value other than the fact that God has said, I want all to be saved. So here we have it here. Here's, here's a passage in 1 Timothy chapter 2. He wants all men to be saved. In, in Acts chapter 17, he wants all men to repent. What's the reason for that? Because there's going to be a day of judgment, and he wants people to be saved. And then we read in, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, uh, people in that time were saying, well, where's the Lord's coming? Where's his second coming? We have, we, you know, he hasn't come in a long time now, and so he must not be coming back. And <clears throat> Peter reminds them that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. He's going to come back. He said he was. He'll be back. He's not slack concerning that promise. Uh, as some men count slackness, but in long, is, is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And there again, the idea of coming to repentance is, is the process that leads us to salvation. So he wants all men everywhere to be saved. So does it make sense that a God that wants that to happen would have created us in such a way that says, okay, this one's saved, that one's not. This one's saved, that one's not. It makes no sense. And we're talking about a God that is of extreme intelligence, and he makes sense. I mean, if we look at Scripture, God makes sense. Now, it mean, doesn't mean we understand everything or every aspect of God, but the Scriptures have never talked about or given us any reason to think that we're decided as we are born whether we're saved or not. And yet people teach that. Well, obviously they would not want to go by the word of God as a basis. But how do you deal with that? We have an intelligent God. God created us. And we're all going to be uh, predestined according to their belief to be saved or to be lost. Why do we go through the problem of writing scripture over hundreds of years of time with multiple authors, all 
with a common theme of God and God giving man the choice to make a decision on which he will do, to be good or to be evil. As we look back in, in history, at least biblical history, was Noah's family predestined when they were all born that that family is going to be saved and the rest of the world is going to be destroyed? I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you view that? And so as we look in our passage this morning, that's the, the text, um, the main text for the lesson, Isaiah 1, 18 through 20. And I'll just read it here from his, his book. He has a different version that he uses. But notice the words here. This is the Lord talking to Israel. Israel has chosen to abandon God. They, they, their worship is atrocity because uh, they despise God. And yet, for some reason, they're going through the motions of worship. And God makes this statement through Isaiah. Come now, let us reason together. Now that, that lets us know that God is a God that wants us to think. It's a God that wants us to make choices. Now obviously as we look at several passages, and we've looked at just a few this morning, but there are many more that indicate that God wants us to make the right choice as we go through life. Not to say, hey, I don't know what I was chosen at birth to be lost or to be saved, but it doesn't matter. I'm just going to do whatever I want to do, what feels good. That just doesn't coincide with God's teaching. And here we see them in a situation where God says, your, your life's not right. You, you're, you're following after uh, the wrong ways. You're going down the wrong path. Uh, this is to Israel. And God says, come, let us reason together. Let's think about this. Let's talk about it. There's no reason to talk about what you're doing in your life if it's already determined. There's no reason for us to even discuss it. We shouldn't even be here today if that, if that belief is truthful. We just go about doing what we do. Don't even try to, to make any adjustments. It's already been determined. And that's, that's tough for us to deal with. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they, be, uh, they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. If you consent, there's the decision being made. If you consent to follow my way and obey, you will eat the best of the land. If you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Truly, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, does that make sense to come from a God who says, it doesn't matter what you're doing in your life, you're already predetermined to be saved or lost? Why would God, an intelligent being, go through all the painstaking effort that he's done to bring about the ability for man to choose between right and wrong, good and evil, light and darkness, truth and error. Why would he do all that he's done throughout Scripture to give us the guidance, the instruction, the teachings that would help us to choose good over evil or right over wrong? if it doesn't matter. And so God here says, you can make a choice. That's just like he's having fun. Let's just, let's just manipulate them a little bit. It's like, can I, let's see if I can get them to go in this direction. And, you know, that's not the, the God that uh, we see in the Bible. Let's reason together. There, he's saying, let, let's talk about this. Let's think about it. And that's what we do when we come and study Scripture. 
Why do we come to Bible class? We come to learn, obviously, but we come to reason. Let's, let's, let's reason this out. Let's make sense of this. God is saying, look, your sins, they're like scarlet. They're just, they're, they're so visible. Uh, there's no doubt that you're living the wrong way. Your lives are demonstrating that you're going down the wrong path. So he first points out to them the, the, that they're in error, they're in sin. And, uh, and then he says, Let's, what can we do about this? What can be done about this? And God says, if you change your way, if you'll consent and obey, you can have the best of the land. Now, if none of that matters, you know, you would have to consider the Bible is just a big hoax, that God's not really who the Bible portrays, and that we have no choice in, in this whatsoever. And yet God has made it clear throughout all Scripture that man has always had a choice. He always has the ability to choose what's right and what's wrong. And then he lets it be totally clear for us, if I think visibly clear in the Old Testament, but more, more clear in the New Testament that we have the ability to decide our course. We have the ability. God has laid out the course for us. He has given us information that lets us to know which course we're on. He's given us the the, the, the um, mile markers, he's given us the signs, the road signs uh, of life, and he's, he's told us that if you go this way, here's what the results are going to be. If you go this way, here's what the results are going to be. And he's made it easy because there's only two paths. And, and, and so, why would God go to all that trouble? The only explanation would be like, He's just trying to play with us. He's just trying to trick us. He just wants to see what we'll do. And he's just laughing at us. That's just not what's portrayed in Scripture. God's a God of concern. He's a God that has always guided, has always provided uh, instruction. God was not the kind of God that would say, well, you've chosen the wrong path and you've been going down it for a long time. No, God was the kind of God which always said, you're fixing to make a mistake. Don't go down that path. He was always a God who says to the people in the past, that says, you stay in this path. This is the way you need to go. That path is dangerous. That path is not the right way to go. He didn't just let people make a choice, and then once they got so far down the path, he said, well, you're on a good path. You have been on a bad path. He's always instructed and try to provide upfront information that says, here's the good path, here's the bad path. And warning signs along the bad, bad path that said, turn around, turn around, you're going in the wrong direction. Passage after passage after passage, God has always provided that. Now, he's either a cruel God, and he's just laughing at us because we're just like a bunch of mice in a maze, and he's, you know, putting a buzzer on every once in a while, and we're reacting to it, or he's the God the Bible portrays that always wants us to choose what's right, and that we have a choice in determining where we end up. God's not forced us in any way. He's never forced us to go down the good path or the bad path. We have gone down those paths because of choices that we have made, and for the most part, uh, we might be able to claim some ignorance on occasion, but God usually always gives us indications that we're going in a certain direction. And it's clear the results of what we can expect. This is not the first time that God has talked to Israel about you're going down the wrong path. Let's try to get your path straightened out. And if you'll listen to me, you'll get the best of the land. That, that's happened all over the place. Here's what I want you to do. If you do it, you're going to be blessed. If you don't do it, there's going to be some, some things that happen that are going to be not that good. 
In the preceding verses from, from 18 through 20, verses 16 through 17 of Isaiah chapter 1, he says, wash yourselves. You're dirty. Not that they were physically dirty, but they were dirty with sin. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the rootless. Defend the, the orphan. Plead for the widow. See, these were things they were abandoning. You're talking about people who were selfish. They weren't looking for other people and trying to help people out. So the widows, the orphans, they were being abandoned. The people who were ruthless were being cheered on. Have you ever seen that in today's society sometimes? It's shocking how that the bad guy is cheered on. Yeah, yeah, keep doing what you're doing. That's great. Do you realize what they're doing? I mean, it's appalling to see some of this stuff. But God has always wanted us to make choices and to make the right choice. If God has predestined anything, it's for us, for him to want us to be people who make the right choices. When he talks about the idea of Ephesians chapter 1 of being predestined to be sons and daughters, the adopted of him, that's because we've made choices that were good choices. We've listened to what he had to say, and we've followed that. It's hard to deal with a doctrine of predestination because it's almost like it's just over with before it begins. You know? Well, what do you got to do to be a part of that, that, it, that belief? No. It's just, it's been decided. I mean, do, do I have to have any real knowledge about this? No. It's just been decided. It's been done. When you're born, the, their teaching is when you're born, it's been decided. When you come into this world, you're either going to be saved or you're going to be lost. You can't do anything about it. <coughs> there's nothing to believe in. There's nothing, I mean, it's just, it's there right at the beginning. As soon as you accept that, it's a done deal. Now, given what we have in terms of the way that, that the world works, given what we have in teachings of Scripture, does it make sense to you that it doesn't matter what you do in this life, that it's already been determined you're going to be saved? Well, what about if I, if I live a life of total corruptness. Doesn't matter. What if I kill a number of people? Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I did. I could wallow in sin for the entirety of my existence, and according to the doctrine of predestination, it would not matter. Now, does that make any sense whatsoever? Just, just on the pure uh, logical thinking, it makes no sense. And yet there are people who believe it. And they say, well, it doesn't really matter. I, you know, I'm either going to be saved or going to be lost. I, I don't have anything to do with it. Um, so I might as well enjoy what I'm doing. Well, if you believe that, you can go through life thinking that. But you know what? That doesn't take away the day of judgment just because that's what you believe. It's a scary doctrine because people will, will take that and say, well, I'm not going to try to look at what the Bible says. Why would I want to do that? It's not going to make a difference. It's not going to change where I'm going. I, I don't want to sit down and reason with the Lord. I don't want to think about it because it's, it's already been decided. If that's what we think, if that's, we've accepted that teaching, I, I'm just sort of speaking for myself here, and I probably shouldn't say this, but given the situation and the 
be in a hypothetical situation. I would go out and do whatever I wanted to, wouldn't you? I mean, if it doesn't matter, let's just go do everything that, that pleases me, that makes me happy. I don't care what it is, just anything. Isn't that the way you would be? That's the way I would be. I can't change anything. It's already been determined. You know, It's like those people who don't believe in heaven. Uh, they'll say, well, I don't believe in heaven. I'll believe there's a hell. I think you just die when you die. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live it up while I'm here. And that's the way they live their lives. God wants to reason with us. God wants us to change our ways. He, he wants us to be able to um, deal with those things that come in life and make choices. Life is about choices. Wouldn't you say so after having lived here for a number of years? Once you've gotten to the age where you can think for yourself and you can reason, wouldn't you say that life is made up of a, a series of choices? Let's look at Romans chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. He's talking here about God. Paul says, God will render to every person according to his deeds. God's going to deal with us according to what we have done. That's how he's going to deal with us. God will render to each person according to his deeds. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey in righteousness, he will provide wrath and indignation. Wait a minute. That's not the God that those who believe in predestination describe. He, he's not going to wait for you to grow up and, and do deeds and, and make choices, and then he's going to reward or punish you based on what you did. That was already determined. And you know, there's just such an unfairness about that. You, you just stop and think about it. If predestination were, were really true, for those persons who are predestined to be saved, not a big deal. They're going to be saved. But what about those who are predestined to be lost? There's nothing that I can do to change that? And so where, where's the logic of this? Here's a person that, and let's, assuming that we were somehow able to be, be identified or we knew at, at some point that we were predestined to be saved or lost, and you have the saved person, they say, well, I'm going to be saved anyway, so I'm just going to go out and do everything I want to do. And it doesn't matter what it is, nothing's off the list, because I'm going to be saved. And here's the person that is been labeled as being lost. And they grow up and they say, this is, this is sad. Uh, I'm going to be lost. And they make a decision that um, maybe nothing can be changed, maybe nothing uh, will matter, but they choose to do what's right their whole life. They always think of other people. They're always taking care of other people. They totally sacrifice their life for other people. Sad thing, they're going to be lost. It didn't matter what they did. How is that difficult to deal with? I have trouble with that. The life that we live, we understand as we grow up. God is in the universe in which we live. Now, it, it's tainted in a lot of places, in a lot of ways. I understand that. But don't we basically, inherently, 
when we grow into a family, don't we normally bring to bear that we should do good? Even if we don't recognize God, don't we as a society sort of understand what, but the difference between right and wrong and what's good and what's evil? Don't we know that? How do we know that? Because God has made his presence known. And why would he do that if it didn't matter? Well, I got to thinking, what about the idea that uh, maybe you're not predestined right at birth. Maybe, maybe, let's just say, for example, people come along and make some choices <coughs> and because they, they made right choices, now they're predestined to be saved. And so bear with me a little bit because this is a little bit off the wall. But I'm trying to, to wrestle and get my arms around the, the idea of, of why we would even consider or entertain the idea of predestination. So maybe those people uh, that figured it out, let's say, uh, started putting things together, understood that they needed to make good choices and right choices, maybe those people were predestined to be saved. Uh, you know, I started thinking down that line. So that there are people who over here had struggled through their lives, and uh, they, they made some good decisions on occasion, but they, they just kept, seemed to make some bad decisions along the way. And we've seen people like that. You know, you seem, seem like, you know, they finally gotten themselves pulled up to a, a point which, where they may be productive in society, and maybe they're, they're trying to get their lives together, and then they make another bad decision. And so they go back down there again. Were those people predestined to be lost? And so I struggle with that. But I struggle with their doctrine. And yet, their doctrine is, it doesn't matter what you do, what you, you decisions that you make, they're not going to matter. But God has always given us choices. And he has always told us ahead of time that the choices that we make have consequences. And, and so he's not someone who just said you're this or you're that. And he has told us he wants all to be saved. And he has given us instruction. He's made it clear to us that salvation is based upon something that he has provided. He's provided that way of salvation every time. Continuing on in Romans chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. And if we talked about predestination and God's role in that, would that not be a partiality with God? Unless it was just a, a thing that happened. God knows all. Let's say that here's, here's baby uh, X over here that was just born. All right, God says, what was next on the list? Oh, you're going to be saved. Then all of a sudden in time, baby Y comes along. Well, <laughs> you followed baby X and baby X is going to be saved, so you're going to be lost. Is that how God would do it? And not be, and to be impartial? I hate to think about that. I, I don't know how to address it. I can understand, I can comprehend, I can, can, can get my senses wrapped around the idea of God saying that I'm going to give everybody an opportunity to be saved. And I'm going to provide everything that I can for you to be saved. I'm going to give you all the, the, the warnings and 
um, and, and Old Testament examples of where people had gone against my teachings. They had the choice to do that, and here are the circumstances and consequences. And God has always said, I want you to be saved. If God had changed his mind at any time down through a series of time, he could have said, you know, that plan that I'm going to put in place where I send my son and he'll offer himself up as a sacrifice and he'll shed his blood. I've just sort of gotten tired of that process. It's taken a long time and mankind has just really uh, frustrated me and I'm just going to not do that. But God has always provided for us the way of right living, the way that we should go and shine the light on that path and say, this is the way I want you to go, and here's how you get there. We looked at Romans 6. Um a few weeks ago, but there's part of it that we didn't uh, touch on, but it's, it's very important. You know, we had to, to, to bury that old man of sin, right? And he reminds the, the Romans, in Romans uh, 6.16, he said, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? We give ourselves up. We make that decision. And we give ourselves over to, to be slaves of one or another. He says if we give ourselves over to sin, it's going to result in death. Or if we give ourselves over to obedience, result in righteousness. But you have a choice. God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which has been delivered to you, and you've been, because you've committed yourself to it, you've been made free from sin. Now, God's not going to provide that kind of instruction or, or understanding of us following down paths and making choices. If those aren't things that we can do, and he's not going to praise and encourage us to go down the right path if it's not something that we should do and must do. And so we have choices to make. And God has made it that way, that we would make choices. Otherwise, why did he even call together the children of Israel and talk to them through Isaiah and say, let's come and reason together. You're in sin. And your sins are as scarlet, but they can be made white as snow if you will consent and obey. But if you won't, then we're going to have problems. Why would God talk to us like that? Why would God always provide those ways of instructions and, and leading us in the paths that we should go in if it doesn't matter? What a waste of time. We would have wasted all of our lives. God would continue to waste all the time that, that we've known him in existence just playing a game with us. It just doesn't make sense. And so either it, it's nonsense and that's what he's doing to us or it makes perfect sense and God is providing for us in every way to do what is right. And I choose to believe the latter because that's what scriptures teach. That's the God that we know from scripture. The God of the, those who are predestined are just, a, it's a cold entity. It, it's someone of coldness and not, not of warmth. You just, they're going to decide when they're born. You're saved, you're lost. You're saved, you're lost. That God does nothing according to them, but but say you're saved, you're lost. He has no interaction with them. There's no coming to know God and coming to know his ways. 
It's just a, just a hard line that's drawn. And you're on one side or the other. And I just have trouble being able to accept that. We will continue to look at a few more scriptures next week. Uh, make it through quick. Go ahead and do your activities in the back of the book. And we'll see how far we get. Thanks for being here.